Uh, really, real pleasure to be with everyone today. This is a critical juncture in the quantum journey. Uh, many of us have been involved for quite a number of years and uh, this year, uh, 2022, is proving to be already just one month in uh, a blockbuster year for these kinds of technologies and the implications in particular for cybersecurity. Uh, I'll be discussing some of the background and lead up to this moment and then look forward to Q&A uh, from the team and from the audience. So the rise of quantum computing uh, poses a absolute existential threat uh, to the many protocols that we use in cyber today. Skip alluded to that in his introductory remarks. Uh, and today I'm gonna to build some background as to how we got here and what uh, both governments, companies, and other organizations are doing about this and what you in this audience can do about it uh, and participate in this generational migration uh, from one uh, cyber standard to the next. Uh, this doesn't happen very often, uh, but it's happening right now and we are all part of it. And we encourage as many people as possible to join in on this transformation because it has implications, not just for cyber, but for other technologies that we use as well. Uh, Right now, we're in the third quantum revolution. The first revolution started uh, in 1900 uh, with uh, Max Planck's realization that we needed a new way of looking at the data that was coming out of key experiments. Experiments done from 1880 to 1900 did not conform to the physics of the time. Uh, the double slit experiment, black body radiation, the stability of the atom, these are just but a few, the discrete spectral lines of hydrogen and other elements. These are but a few of the experimental data points that really confused physicists uh, right before the year 1900. Max Planck in quote unquote, an act of desperation uh, at his villa outside of Berlin decided to jot down a novel equation uh, that made the assumption uh, of a different kind of physics than was existing at that time. And that was quite surprising because if you would have known Max Planck at the time, you would have voted him least likely to cause a revolution in any field, let alone physics. And that's because Max Planck was a very mild-mannered uh, physicist in his 40s at the time. He got his PhD in thermodynamics, uh, uh, filed his PhD, submitted that in 1879, interestingly enough, the year that Einstein was born. And uh, he was content to write out his years as a very um, high status professor in the university in Berlin, uh, teaching and doing research uh, in thermodynamics. But uh, destiny had other ideas for him and he came up with initial, in, in, initially an, an equation and then had to begin to step back and understand what were the implications of this equation. And of course, the others in the picture on the left at the first Solvay conference uh, sorry, at the 1927 conference, uh, kicked in. And uh, back in the year 1900, 1905, then Einstein uh, publishes his Honest Mirabalis papers, one of which was the photoelectric effect for which he got the Nobel Prize. He never got a Nobel Prize for relativity, but did get it for the photoelectric effect, which built specifically and explicitly in the paper on Max Planck's uh, great achievement uh, in explaining then the photoelectric effect using Max Planck's ideas that he used to explain the black body radiation phenomenon. And then many others in this photo, of course, contributed and 17 of these individuals got Nobel prizes for their work in founding quantum mechanics, which around the year 1935 was canonized as the rock and others put the finishing touches on it. Uh, we then moved to the second quantum revolution where the students of the folks on the left and their students and their students began to take those principles and build devices, actual devices in the world, such as the transistor built by three physicists at Bell Labs, which enables us to talk today, all of us on Zoom right now, uh, the MRI machine built with quantum physics principles without which it would not work or could be conceived. And of course, the laser, just as three examples of the second quantum revolution that took place from the 1940s uh, plateauing out in the 1980s uh, in the application of quantum principles uh, to very significant technology revolutions that affect all of us. But now we find ourselves starting about two, three years ago 
in the third quantum revolution. And the third quantum revolution entails three major aspects in addition to computing itself. Uh, we'll talk about computing in a minute, but on top of that, we have simulation and optimization, uh, the ability to simulate molecular interaction, atomic interaction, which of course is governed by quantum dynamics, quantum mechanics itself. We cannot use older classical notions uh, in modeling and simulating the interaction at the atomic and molecular level. We have to use the quantum equations uh, and this necessitates new physical computing substrates um, and new ways of approaching these very large scale problems that exceed the kinds of things we can do traditionally. Uh, sensing, quantum sensing, using a variety of, of quantum devices uh, as sensors takes us beyond the classical regime in how we can detect magnetic fields, gravitational fields, and many other phenomena around us. Uh, the quantum sensors, such as NV centers and diamond, such as OPM and others, take us into the, class, into the quantum regime where we can do so much more with greater sensitivity. And finally, our big topic of today is security and communications. And quantum catalyzes uh, the need to move into new regimes uh, in protecting the world's data, both data in motion and data at rest. Uh, and so we'll talk about that today. But we are now squarely in the third quantum revolution. And we welcome everyone on this call to join in. Uh, if you feel intimidated any time by the word quantum or by quantum mechanics, um, you're, in, you're in a very large boat in a cruise liner of folks uh, and, and Feynman and many others, Niels Bohr are both quoted as saying, if anyone says they understand quantum mechanics, they do not understand quantum mechanics. Um, it still puzzles all of us till today. But the good news is there's a lot of online content today, online courses uh, from so many institutions and from individuals, uh, books, uh, online websites, uh, really great ways to get into this field. So do not feel it's too late. If you haven't studied quantum in undergraduate or grad school, it's fine. There's many ways to on-ramp into this field. Uh, if you have a background in cryptography, that's a great leg up to go into this third area of the new quantum era of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, and there's ways to ramp up into that as well. This is a wonderful golden era of education and self-learning. Uh, and this is a moment to dive with both feet in. So do not feel you're left out if you didn't study these topics uh, in school. Uh, in fact, if you had studied those topics any more than one year ago, you would have studied very outdated material. So the good news is you can leapfrog in, join in the revolution uh, and, and be part of moving the transformation forward. Uh, quantum computer technologies to start with, uh, there's many ways to build a quantum computer. Uh, and right now, there are many companies out there, well-funded, both big tech and startups, and startups that have now raised six, seven hundred million dollars each, uh, having multi-billion dollar valuations, uh, hard at work building these computers, and all going for that same goal of a fault-tolerant, error-corrected, scaled quantum computing platform. Uh, many exciting announcements happening every month in this field. So I encourage you to check out these various ways of building a quantum computer. There are others as well uh, that I don't mention on that slide, Neutral Atom amongst them, uh, that are very promising as well. And the difference in the quantum computing revolution compared to uh, previous revolutions is that quantum computers are born on the cloud. They're cloud native. When we look at the previous cycles of computing hardware from the IBM 360 and the DEC and VAX, and then we went to the SGI and Sun uh, mini computer systems, and then we went to Dell and its many competitors, then Lenovo, and now uh, the commoditization, the complete commoditization of classical computers. Then of course, the parallel revolution with GPUs uh, with uh, the rise of NVIDIA and their tremendous success and in innovation in taking a graphical processing unit initially meant for video game uh, rendering and production, moving that squarely into the neural network deep learning era uh, and now beyond that and the great success NVIDIA and many other chip companies have had. There's many startups now in the ASIC space uh, such as GraphCore and Grok 
uh, and many others. Cerebrus now also with a whole wafer as a chip. So a lot of exciting stuff. But when we see the past 30, 40 years of that evolution of classical uh, hardware, we see that over 70 years in each mini cycle, they get commoditized. That commoditization will happen even quicker um, with uh, quantum hardware because it's cloud native. So most people will not be buying quantum computers. They'll be accessing it over the cloud. And right now you can go to any one of these providers and access a quantum computer this minute uh, as we speak on this uh, call today uh, and access actual quantum computers and run real super states of superposition entanglements using CNOT gates and other gates on actual computing hardware. Uh, so it's a very exciting moment that we can access that. And the good news about that commoditization, which, me which means that the pricing will come down significantly, it's already very accessible, will get even more accessible both to academia and to corporations. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of innovation across all these companies, um, both in the West and in China, uh, in access to these kinds of computing devices. As the computers scale, they'll become accessible over the cloud and we'll see this commoditization happen even more quickly. That's good for all of us on this call today. As we build applications on those computers, uh, they'll be more accessible with greater numbers of uh, qubits and higher fidelities, and then ultimately error corrected high fidelity qubits that we can run even more applications on. But when it comes to cyber, we have to be aware of the threat that is now upon us. Uh, cyber tech, uh, we all know about weaponized cyber tech, no need for reminders with news every day of ransomware and of attacks and breaches of hundreds of millions of people's credit cards, personal information, uh, IP and corporate espionage is rampant now across the world uh, with uh, nation states and independent actors hacking into networks to grab IP from pharma companies, from other high tech companies and high IP rich companies uh, in order to gain leverage in the commercial marketplace to say nothing, of course, of government to government uh, espionage as well. And so this has led to the attack that's underway right now, which is store now, decrypt later, SNDL. Uh, some we also say is hack now, decrypt later, which means that even though we don't have quantum computers this minute that can run shores to a scale to break the length of keys used today, that has not stopped nation states and independent hackers hacking into networks of companies and countries right now, grabbing RSA encrypted data, storing it for a number of years from now when they can decrypt it with increased computing power. So that is the SNDL, SNDL attack happening right now. How do we defend against that attack? That'll be a core topic of our discussion today. Uh, the exponential speed up that Shore gives, I think is well known to many uh, here. And Peter Shore showed in his paper from 1994 when he was at Bell Labs at that time. Today, Peter, of course, is at MIT. And I encourage everyone on this call to take uh, the course offered at MIT online. Uh, it's a four week quick course by Peter, by Ike Schwang and others at MIT. Great content there. Uh, if people want to log on to MIT X Pro uh, and uh, avail themselves of that course. Uh, but uh, Peter has continued to serve the community decades after his initial discovery. Uh, but his discovery really set off a huge bomb in the space, uh, making it clear that RSA's days ultimately would come to an end. And so in 1978, uh, Ravesh Shamir and Edelman uh, introduced RSA, and that's become the standard for so many decades since then. But now we're in a generational migration beyond RSA, getting beyond RSA into the post RSA era. And uh, it's, in a, it's a very, very exciting time for that. And so we see on this slide here that uh, we are now in the midst of having to upgrade 20 billion physical devices. The software on 20 billion devices has to be upgraded. Uh, and that, are, that includes seven, eight billion 
mobile phones. It includes billions of IoT devices. It includes billions of laptops and servers. All these have to be upgraded. Uh, and that is underway already starting now, let alone obviously many software applications on networks, enterprise software, individual software, all has to be upgraded, not just a one time. This is not just like a Y2K one time ball game. This is a continual process to keep improving the ability to go from the single protocol of RSA into a multi protocol world uh, where multiple protocols are now being blessed by the world cyber community. Uh, this is a more complex, nuanced world that we're going into in the post quantum era. That's why we call post RSA also. PQC, post-quantum cryptography. I'll use those interchangeably throughout this talk. And so six years ago, NIST, along with its counterparts around the world, began a process to examine and uh, analyze the various candidates to replace RSA into a post-quantum period. Uh, and that led to three rounds of culling. Uh, submissions in round one were 82, 69 of which were accepted. Round two, uh, culled that down to 26, and then 15, and now we're down to the seven finalists. Uh, and as I'll discuss now in a few slides, we're now down to the acceptance of the core protocols that we're all going to be moving to in the post-quantum period, PQC or post-RSA period. When I say post-RSA, again, RSA is not the only protocol that is now vulnerable, uh, elliptic curve, um, other protocols based on Diffie-Hellman also vulnerable. And so I'm just using that as a, a general catch-all uh, for the era that we're going from and to, from RSA to post-RSA. Europe also very engaged with NIST in the standardization process and the counterparts to NIST in Germany, France, UK, and other countries, absolutely shoulder to shoulder in participating in these areas, submitting many of the protocols into the NIST process. It's a global process with contributions from many, many countries uh, making it to the end uh, and participation from all those agencies around the world. Uh, this is a summary slide of the final moves from 15 down to seven, uh, both in encryption as well as digital signatures. Uh, and you can see that lattice-based cryptography certainly figures prominently in there. Uh, I should note that this is, uh, again, a global phenomenon with investment being made across the world on the governmental basis. This slide really captures the governmental side of the billion plus on the National Quantum Initiative in the US, billion plus in the EU, 10 billion plus in China. What is not captured on the slide are the billions additional of investment now happening just in the last seven, eight months uh, in the private sector, particularly in the US, Canada and Europe uh, in private companies uh, such as Cyquantum, IonQ, Xanadu, uh, many, many other companies that have raised significant rounds in the last year are all joining in on this total contribution and investment in this area. So when we look at cybersecurity and post-quantum crypto, uh, we can first look as a backdrop and context, the executive order 14028 uh, from the White House in May of 2021 which first focuses on zero trust architecture, ZTA. ZTA is critical. Anyone on this call uh, in the cyber realm will be very familiar with ZTA, uh, which of course we all must move to a ZTA uh, stance and posture if we're to contain the kinds of attacks that we see happening on a regular basis today. Uh, and that is underway with both that executive order, but also uh, many activities happening in the private sector as well. Uh, on January 19th, though, uh, just uh, in the last few weeks, uh, the U.S. government issued an additional national security memorandum, which has key directives in it that build on EO 14028 with specific focus on post-RSA and PQC. Uh, and I'll be describing some of those specific uh, items here today. So I recommend to folks to check out EO 14028. Uh, it's available online. Uh, and the zero trust architecture that the federal government is moving to, and many federal governments across the world. This is not a US centric uh, idea at all. This is a global phenomenon moving to ZTA. Uh, and part of that also is now 
uh, the NSM of, of January 2022, just happening right now, uh, with very specific milestones and goals. And since it's a lot of text, I'll summarize it in a timeline here, where within 30 days of the January 19th directive, the NSA is updating the CNSA uh, in order to adopt several of these newer protocols. And to remind ourselves what the CNSA is, it's the Commercial National Security Algorithmic Suite, uh, which is the core algorithm suite uh, containing the standards that we all use. Although it's managed by the government, we in the private sector all turn to this as well uh, for the kind of standards and protocols that we use, uh, be it in financial services, in healthcare for HIPAA compliant data, uh, in many other sectors as well. We depend on what is in this algorithm suite uh, for our security and safety. And so within 30 days of Jan 19, NSA is updating with these new protocols that come from the NIST process, these open processes that have now been publicly discoursed uh, across the cyber community over the last 25 years since Peter Shore's paper, and in particular the last six years with a very open, multi-stakeholder, multinational process uh, that uh, many of us have participated in and also will be updating the CNSS, which is uh, the core committee. Uh, and just to remind ourselves, the CNSS is the Committee on National Security Systems, which is 21 governmental agencies that have responsibility to look after the security of data, not just within the federal government, but also the key infrastructure of the country. Uh, and again, what we hear also from other countries in, in Europe, and many other parts of the world that they are moving uh, in parallel in a harmonized fashion since they were part of this process as well. And so within 60 days, there'll be notification of the CIOs of the federal government. 90 days, the CNSS uh, shall be starting to update its policies and directives. That means that if you have a policy inside the federal government that for this kind of data or this kind of data movement, you need to use this kind of key and this kind of protocol. These will be now be updated given the updates of the CNSA of the algorithm suite itself. And then within 180 days of Jan 19, the key federal agencies that contain sensitive data will be doing a top to bottom assessment of where they're using vulnerable protocols such as RSA, elliptic curve and others in order to start that migration process to a post quantum cryptographic world. So very specific milestones, very specific actions on the part of the federal government as a signal to the marketplace that it is time to move. So while this NSM building on 14028 uh, is initially dealing with the federal government, it has deep ripples out, almost like gravity waves that we detect with LIGO, deep waves out to the private sector, because we in turn take our cues from the CNSA uh, and these actions as well. This is a graphical depiction of some of the movement that we'll see over the next six months uh, as CIOs across the federal government begin to act on the directive and the EO. Uh, and this leads us to a conversation around what exactly are these PQC approaches? What are we talking about? I think most of us on this call are familiar with the uh, details or at least generally familiar with RSA, Ravesh Shamir Edelman, and how that affords us PKI, public key infrastructure, uh, or PKE, public key encryption, uh, having a public key and a private key, depending on what we call a one-way trapdoor function, uh, which is a function that allows us easily to encrypt something, uh, but very difficult to go back the other way, unless you have the trap door, which is our way of saying the private key. So one way trap door functions are the key to making successful public key infrastructure with a private key and a public key, much easier than meeting in a bunker or a skiff every minute to exchange uh, one-time pads. If you want to interact with uh, Amazon or other e-commerce players, it's gonna be very difficult to fly to Seattle every minute and exchange one-time pads, much easier to use public key infrastructure, of course. And so mathematicians and cryptanalysts worked for 25 years since Peter's paper to look for 
uh, mathematical frameworks that had the same characteristics, the same characteristics that were so great about RSA that we can build public key uh, infrastructure around it, uh, but did not depend on the hardness of factoring large numbers into their prime factors. That's the core of RSA. And unfortunately, of course, Shor's algorithm is very good on a scale quantum computer of doing exactly that thing. So we've got to move beyond that particular math framework into other mathematical frameworks. The good news is after a lot of work, the academics did a su superb job in coming up with a number of approaches that have stood the test of time in terms of being able to enable public key infrastructure with public keys, private keys, enabling the same idea of a one-way trapdoor function of easy to encrypt your message, very difficult to go back the other way unless you have the private key. And just to give a flavor of some of these, we have a whole course uh, that takes uh, weeks, about three to five weeks, if people are interested, uh, we'll be offering a course on the math behind post-quantum cryptography. And we hope to offer that uh, to uh, partners and the public uh, over the next months uh, as this area uh, becomes of greater interest to people. Uh, but now we've already had many, many requests coming into our team to teach the mathematics behind post-quantum cryptography. It's fascinating mathematics, and I encourage everyone uh, to take the time to learn some of the math behind it, because I, just intellectually alone, I think you really enjoy it. Uh, lattice space is one such uh, approach that is now stood the test of time. And as I showed in the NIST process, a number of the winners of the finalists coming out of three rounds of culling in the NIST space process are lattice space. So it has stood 25 years of testing and also specifically the pummeling of the global NIST and multinational process. And here we have a lattice, which we can think of as a vector space, but discretized. So instead of every point being available, we only have these discrete points uh, at, at, as you see here in this depiction. Uh, and we then look, for example, for the shortest vector problem is one way of thinking about this, where we offer a certain uh, basis, computational basis, in this particular vector space, this lattice space, uh, but then the private key uh, is the shortest vector uh, basis. And that is actually turns out to be a very hard thing to find if you're not offered it. So without going into huge numbers of, uh, of details, uh, we're going to say that this is one of the methods that has stood the test of time. It does not depend on factoring large numbers, doesn't depend on prime numbers or anything related to the way that RSA works, but does allow us to have both a public key and a private key, and therefore is a robust solution to encrypting our data without fear that we'll be losing that data to large scaled quantum computers. There are other ways of doing this as well. Code based is one, isogeny based, hash based, multivariate based. Uh, again, we don't have time today to go into all the mathematics here. But stay tuned. If people are interested, please reach out to us so you can sign up uh, for our open courses that we'll be offering on the background to PQC, uh, and we'll be offering that to partners and to the public. Uh, one note on China. China has been focusing not only on PQC, but even more so on QKD. And so since this will come up as a topic of conversation, I did want to note uh, 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 some details on quantum key distribution. And so back in 19, 2016, uh, the Chinese launched the Missia satellite uh, named after a medieval scholar, Moza uh, in Mandarin. Uh, and uh, the Missia satellite uh, has successfully demonstrated quantum teleportation of messages and information uh, from uh, space to ground stations. Uh, and they published that in a number of peer reviewed uh, publications. I encourage the audience to check out those publications very interested to see. We all knew about quantum teleportation for many years. The protocol itself is over 20 years old, uh, but it was great to see it in practice uh, and to see that happening from an actual satellite uh, then reaching ground stations. Uh, the speed at which it was done was not particularly high, but that was not the point of the demonstration. Uh, the point is to show that you can have a terrestrial network, as you see here, a fiber optic cable, uh, for terrestrial QKD, 
uh, where you'd have a number of quantum repeaters uh, every few hundred kilometers or so. And then you would connect this terrestrial network with ground stations connected to a series of satellites. That's the architecture the Chinese are going after here. And they have quite a number of academics and companies building out this infrastructure. Quantum repeaters still remain elusive, uh, both in the East and the West. And it's something that a number of us are working on. Uh, but uh, quantum repeaters, I believe, will ultimately happen, allowing the uh, repeating and amplification of a quantum signal. Again, let's recall that today's internet, no matter how fast the speed you have, even if you have a gigabit per second speed uh, to your home right now or to your phone, depending on where you are, uh, that network cannot carry states of superposition and entanglement. So there is a parallel internet that is being built out around the world now in the same way that ARPANET, DARPANET, the internet was built out node by node by node, interconnecting those nodes. Just like in 1969, we had the beginnings of the build out of ARPANET, then DARPANET, and today will be called the internet work or the internet. So too, there will be a parallel internet, a quantum coherent internet, coherent, just code word for a network that can carry and maintain states of superposition and entanglement. Beyond quantum communications, let me note that there's a lot of scientific interest in having such a network. And so if you wanted to have distributed quantum computing, DQC, and be able to have a quantum computer in New York City, a quantum computer in London, a quantum computer in Mountain View, uh, and all connected so that they can share different computing states, passing them amongst themselves, the same way we do distributed computing in the classical world, for that kind of distributed computing, you need a quantum coherent network. So there's even a bigger driver to creating a parallel quantum internet than just communications. Uh, and, and that is DQC, distributed quantum computing, as well as the prospect of connecting quantum sensors, which output quantum information and then being directly fed into quantum processors on that quantum coherent network. So we have a world ahead of us over the next few decades that is quite exciting. Uh, and it's exciting to see some of the work being done both in China, but also being picked up by Europe. There's a lot of interesting QKD work being done in Europe right now. In fact, a number of countries are following the Chinese in launching satellites uh, that do QKD and quantum teleportation at a distance. One example is Singapore's Spooky One satellite What's interesting about the Spooky satellite is that unlike the Chinese Missia satellite, which is a traditional, very large format satellite platform, this is a 3U in satellite terms. We go and use, uh, these are the units we use to describe particularly nano sats. And this is a nine pound 3U CubeSat uh, or NanoSat that is up in space right now from the Singaporean authority and already demonstrated success in sending quantum signals. So I encourage the audience to check out this very exciting area um, that will push the envelope of what we can do both sat space to ground as well as terrestrially over time. So let me just summarize now, and then we'll go to Q&A. Uh, we're going, undergoing a generational change uh, in cybersecurity uh, that is even bigger in many ways than the change we went through in the 70s and 80s to RSA in that we're now moving to a multi-protocol uh, setup and posture. This is a more complicated, more nuanced world we're getting into. Uh, the migration is vast, 20 billion physical devices have to be upgraded, uh, billions and billions of additional instances on networks and in different applications have to be upgraded and not just upgraded one time, but continued innovation is necessary to bring latency down, to improve uh, security, to defend against side channel attack, uh, to have a robust global network uh, that is robust against the quantum attack uh, and other attacks they were already familiar with. Uh, there's been a long maturation period. This did not happen overnight. Thousands and thousands of academics and company uh, uh, engineers have been involved in this over decades to make this happen. And I do want to recognize the multinational uh, work that's been done in an open process 
with many people participating from many countries, uh, but the time to act is now. And I do wanna just note before Q&A that those listening that are getting their masters or PhD, uh, PhDs or in postdoc programs, uh, I do wanna encourage folks, we, we, we have a training program at Sandbox where we further train people while they're getting masters and PhDs and postdocs. Uh, we uh, encourage folks to come and join us for three to six months. There's an application process. You can email Susie and Monica of our team to find out about that. We pour a lot of time and money into the educational world uh, because right now we don't have the amount of human power uh, and human capital to meet the demands that we just outlined in this talk today and that you'll hear from the other great speakers uh, today as well in the, in the session. Uh, we need more people to join in. If you're curious about getting uh, an online master's or other kinds of certificates in the space, please also ping Susie and Monica. It's a great opportunity right now to join in on this transformation and revolution. Uh, if you're in a program right now, uh, you can join us for three to six months virtually right now, of course, during the COVID era. You don't have to travel. We do it virtually uh, right now. Prior to COVID, we had hundreds of such masses and PhD students join us on site. Uh, but now, of course, we do it virtually. And we also have postdoc positions as well. So with that, uh, thank you, Skip, for mentioning the book as well. It just came out in its second edition. Uh, and now available, and also a lot of free material on the GitHub site. I encourage folks to go to the GitHub site to get a lot of the code and free information and slide decks uh, that we use in our training as well. So with that, thank you.